We're going to pick up a passage from last week, but I want to reread with you chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, the first 12 verses. Paul writes, you know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put a a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, nor from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. God's word. God's word. Isn't that wonderful? How many have ever had to defend themselves? Is that a delightful task? No, it's very distasteful. None of us likes to have to defend ourselves. And yet Paul is here in the midst of defending himself and his companions, Silas and Timothy, against all the attacks on his integrity, their integrity, and the ministry. There are false teachers Uh, There are Judaizers, there are people who are calling into question Paul's authority as an apostle, uh, Paul's authenticity, his sincerity, his genuineness, and as well, his faith. So in this section, he's he's come to the point where he just simply defends himself. And as we looked last time, I teased out five elements that are essential not only for Paul and his companions, but also for us. Five elements that are absolutely essential uh, if we are to give evidence of a faithful and fruitful ministry effort. How many want to be counted faithful? How many want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant? How many want their lives to be fruitful? And not just in the everyday things, but fruitful for God's glory. And so whenever we step out to, to attempt these things, we find there's going to be opposition. And remember, our battle is not against what? Flesh and blood, right? There's spiritual forces of darkness that hate the gospel, that hate God, that hate you and I are going to do. There's nothing beneath them that they won't go to to deceive us, to discourage us, to defeat us. And so we need to be aware of those things. So Paul here now is going to defend himself. And just real quickly, I want to rehearse with you those five elements that characterized his ministry and his life. First of all, verse 2, his confidence, remember, was in the power of God, not his own power, not his own strength. He said, God helped us. We suffered much in Philippi. There was much opposition here in Thessalonica, but we came to you also but with God's help. He was confident in the very power of God. Secondly, his integrity was called into question. But he says his integrity was based on his commitment 
to God's word in verse 3. In verse 4, his call and his approval was by God. God called him and God approved him. He doesn't need man's approval. Sometimes we think we need other people's approval when in fact we don't. We need only God's approval and God's call. And then the fourth element was quite simply his accountability to God. He knew in God's omniscience that God knew every thought. He knew every intention. He knew everything about Paul. And hence, with that knowledge, he's accountable to God. He didn't come with false motives. He didn't uh, wear a mask. He wasn't greedy uh, towards the Thessalonians. And then lastly, he exhibited a humble spirit. And that humble spirit was not for his own glory, but rather for the glory of God. I want God glorified in everything we do. To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. So as he's articulating these five elements, we look now into verses 7 through 12. And he's continuing to vindicate himself by simply against these false accusations of the enemies of the gospel. The enemies think they're enemies of Paul, but they're really enemies of the gospel. It's not us. We're not the focus. The gospel is the focus of the adversary. And so he begins to describe his attitude now toward the Thessalonians. The five qualities that we just described uh, describe the virtues of Paul's inner life. Is the inner life important? Oh, absolutely. I would submit to you that Effective ministry, fruitful ministry, faithful ministry is a combination of two things, character and action, the internal and the external. It's not enough that we just say we love God. It's not enough that we hold these internal characteristics. They must, of necessity, work themselves out in our everyday life. Would you agree? Recall uh, what uh, is written about David in Psalm 78, verse 72. And David shepherded them. In other words, the nation of Israel. He was the greatest king, and he shepherded them with two things. What are they? Integrity of heart and what? Skillful hands. In other words, the internal and the external. Now Paul reminds the Thessalonians of his love for them. And he uses, in this text, the most intimate and compelling metaphors. He uses the metaphors of a mother and a father. What better metaphors could he use to describe his love for those Thessalonians? Look at verse 7 with me again. He says, As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. He reminds them that instead of operating uh, with deceitfulness, abusiveness, I mean, you get people who are just in the ministry for their own benefit, and they can be deceitful and abusive. He's not. He's assuring them that all the accusations against him are not true. But they are true of the false teachers. But he says to them that we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children. What a beautiful picture. Again, Notice in the middle of that sentence is the word but, contrasting the attitude and behavior of Paul and his companions with those of the false teachers. We're like this, but they were like that. They were like that. The word gentle is the very heart of verse 7. The very heart. It means to be kind. It encompasses a whole host of other virtues, acceptance, respect, Compassion, tolerance of imperfections, patience, tenderheartedness, loyalty. That, that word, gentle, it, it comprises a number of different facets and dynamics. It's not easy just to define it with a simple definition. Like a mother with her little children. And unlike 
most of those itinerant false teachers of the day, Paul and his friends had come to Thessalonica not to exploit the people for their own benefit, but to live and serve among them with kindness, like a mother, as she does caring for her own little children. Isn't that wonderful? Now, Paul doesn't consider himself a paid surrogate mother. He doesn't consider himself a hired nanny. He doesn't consider himself a daycare worker. He compares himself again as a mother caring for her little children. How many moms do we have here? How many moms can kind of relate to this? Yeah. And Paul and Silas and Timothy, they're not intending to accomplish their ends, their agenda, their desires through the people. No. They want to see what God does in the people. We can use people all the time, can't we? We can abuse people all the time. We have an agenda. We can try to win their loyalty and, and use them and abuse them. It's not Paul's intention. It's his intention to see God's will done in the lives of those people. God, have your way in my life. Have your way in my life. How many have ever prayed that prayer? Verse 8. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. So he's, he's extending this metaphor of a caring mother. And as he does so, he goes on to describe his motivation. What's his motivation? What does he identify as his motivation for doing this? It's a four-letter word. It begins with L. Love. Love. We loved you so much. Now, the word Paul uses there, translated in our English, love, means to long for someone passionately and earnestly. And it's linked to a mother's love. It's intended to express an affection so deep, so compelling, as to be unsurpassed. I submit to you, Next to God's love, there is no love that surpasses a mother's love. A mother's love. Moms, you understand this. That's why Paul uses the metaphor. And that love is not out of a sense of obligation. Paul and his partners are not carrying out an assignment simply as God's messengers. It was their highest joy, he says. They were delighted to share. What were they delighted to share? Two things. What were they? Anybody? Just shout it out. The gospel of God. They were delighted to share the gospel of God. Can we take our cue from them? Are we delighted to share the gospel? We love people so much. They were delighted to share the gospel of God with them. What is the gospel? The gospel is the truth. It's God's good news. We're lost. We're by, by nature objects of wrath. We're lost. There's no... No illusions. We're conceived, born, headed for hell. God's not sending people to hell. His purpose is to rescue them. He's calling out, stop, stop. It's like you see someone driving, going over a cliff. You do all you can to stop them, right? Because you know the certain end. No, God's purpose is to save people from hell. And so he says, I have good news. You don't know it, but you're lost. You don't know it, but you're an object of my wrath. You don't know it. You don't realize that you're a sinner. Do people like to be known as sinners? 
No, that's, that's a hard thing. I talked to a woman at the, at the checkout line a couple weeks ago. I do my normal thing. She says, oh, how are you? What's my response? Better than I deserve. And, of course, her response is, well, no, you, you must deserve good. I said, no, 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 I deserve hell. I said, but Jesus saved me. Jesus saved me. You see, I was a sinner, and Jesus saved me. And given that, her response was, oh, I don't believe any of that. I said, really? Too bad. I'll be back. So Paul says, I'm delighted. We're, we're delighted to share the gospel, to, to, to tell people, to tell you about Jesus and what he's done on your behalf. He bore your sin, your grief, your sorrow, your diseases, your guilt upon himself on that Roman cross. And he died. He was buried. But death couldn't keep him down. He rose from the dead. He's alive He's alive, and he's coming back. Yes. But not only did they share the gospel, they also instructed these Thessalonians on how to live holy lives. Holy lives in obedience to God's word and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, pastor, you just don't, you don't know, realize how hard it is for me, how hard it is. I just, I just can't seem to break this cycle. No, no, you don't hate your sin enough to break the cycle. You don't believe. Well, no, I love Jesus. No, you don't. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I say. When you're born again, you're a new creation. I'm forever telling people, reminding, look at, look at, you have a brand new nature. You're not the same person you were before. God has changed you. He made you a new creation. You have a whole new future ahead of you. And he's put his spirit in you to empower you to do what he wants you to do. All it requires is you take every day a step of faith. A step of faith. Trusting and believing, no matter how timid and scary you might find it, you take a step of faith to obey him. Is God there to meet that step of faith? Every single time. Every single time. But not only that, they're instructing the Thessalonians that there is an internal glory awaiting for them. When Jesus comes back, he comes back for his bride, the church. We're all looking forward to that, aren't we? Should we be alive? Would that be not an awesome event? He's coming with power, all the angels of heaven to receive his church to himself. And you and I are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Oh, man. That's why Jesus says, keep looking up. You don't know the hour he's going to come. So they were delighted to share the gospel of God with them because it's great news. But they were also delighted to share something else with them. What else was that? They shared their own lives. Besides sharing the gospel, we were delighted to share our lives with you. Share our lives with you. And there was nothing superficial or partial about that. Their service was was full on. May I submit to you that a mother does the same thing when she at great personal cost unselfishly and generously sets aside her life for the benefit of her children. Is that a fair statement? 
Most all the moms I know, I see that. I see that reflected in how they live their lives and they have kids. I saw it in my mom. I witnessed in my wife's life with our son. Great personal cost. It's not about them. It's about their children. I see single moms doing the same thing. Moms, to me, are, are heroes. But single moms are really heroes. I've seen single moms over the years that I've known in our church holding down two, three jobs. I'm saying, where's the dad? Where's the husband? Well, you're, you're, you're carrying this whole load. No one else is going to do it. Great personal sacrifice. Mothers. 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 And these Thessalonians have become so dear to Paul and Silas and Timothy that they ministered to them with an attitude of all-out commitment. They shared their lives with them. We used to have a T-shirt here, and uh, I wore mine out. I, I loved it so much. It was great, and I wish we had some more. I'm going to lobby for some more because I want them. <laughs> you know, it was a blue T-shirt, light blue, and, and it had the circle on it, and it said, all in. I love to wear it. And invariably, people will be walking towards him. They see a T-shirt and they say, wow, that is a cool T-shirt. I said, what does it mean? Well, all in. But all in for what? <laughs> I got varieties of responses, obviously. So. But again, another opportunity just to share. All in for Jesus, right? Look at verse 9. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Again, Paul reminds them, surely you remember. What does he want them to remember? He wants them to remember the toil and hardship with which he and his companions served them. Again, these words reflect a loving mother's concern and application of that concern for her children. Toil and hardship. Every mother knows. Every mother knows there's no price that her children can pay for what she has done for them. Now, every now and again, a mother might be saying, you have no idea what I went through to birth you. To nurse you, to be up in the middle of the night with you when your father was sleeping. <laughs> Most moms I know are not above once in a while reminding the child of this great sacrifice. Amen, <laughs> but moms don't expect those children to compensate them. For all this care and all this concern. Money can't pay for it. Money can't pay for it. And in the same way, Paul tells the Thessalonians that he and Silas and Timothy eagerly ministered to them with no desire for compensation. The compensation, by the way, that they had the right to. He writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about the oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. So if we've sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? 
So Paul's just very talking to the, to the Corinthians about their need to support the ministry. We have a very generous congregation. You guys have always been faithful to support what God's doing here through your tithes and offerings. And I encourage you, even in their difficult economic times, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't cut your tithes short, your offerings short. Who supplies you? God. Keep that in mind. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, and again he quotes Moses, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. And so again, Paul tells Timothy, who's a a young pastor shepherding the church at Ephesus, telling him how to conduct church, that there needs to be teaching on stewardship and giving. And Paul gives a further explanation of their sacrifice in 2 Thessalonians. When we get to 2 Thessalonians, we'll read this. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you nor do we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we work night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. Again, remember, he's contrasting his ministry from that of the false teachers who would take advantage every point they could. It was all about greed and money. That's why he talks about that in this passage. So what did they live on? How did Paul support himself if he's telling the Thessalonians, look, we didn't want to be a burden to you guys. The Philippians supported them. He talks earlier about how the Philippians gave way beyond their ability to give to support Paul and his partners in the ministry. And notwithstanding the fact that Paul also had a part-time job. He was a tent maker. He also had this um, trade that he would fall back on when he had to. So they were supported via those means. But they pictured themselves as spiritual mothers who made the maximum effort to provide gentle, intimate affection, sacrificial love, hardworking provision as they proclaimed the gospel of God. But the maternal metaphor only partially describes their ministry to the Thessalonians. Paul now is going to pick up the second aspect of that metaphor. He's going to talk about the role in terms of how a father deals with his own children. So he says, in effect, we treated you like mothers with love, kindness. Now we're going to tell you how we treat you as fathers. Are both needed? Absolutely. Both are needed. Mothers and fathers. I I talked with a mom this last month and she was telling me how she's just so shocked and surprised. Her her son, you know, for his growing up years was was all over her. He couldn't he didn't want to leave her, didn't want her to leave him, and and then all of a sudden he's not interested in her anymore. He just wants to spend all this time with his father. And she goes, What did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. This is the nature of things. Young boys grow up, they want their mom, mama, 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 and then pretty soon they need their dad. Now there's an interesting verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul writes, he says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. I discovered that verse a number of years ago. It's always spoken to me. I remember my dad when I was a young guy. My dad said to me one day, Son, you need to act like a man. (laughs) Now, unfortunately, he didn't tell me how a man acts. (laughs) So I looked around at all the other men, how they were acting. And I, too, became one of the actors You know what I'm talking about? Men today don't know how to be men. We don't know how to be men. No one has taught us how to be men. Our own fathers don't teach us how to be men. 
What does it mean to be a man? Not a girly man. A man man. Our culture is teaching us how to be girly men. Paul is exhorting those Corinthians to conduct themselves, those men to conduct themselves in a courageous manner. We should all exhibit a strength of conviction, should we? What are my convictions? What are my convictions? And do I have the courage to stand on those convictions? When Paul wrote that verse in 1 Corinthians, I wonder if he had in mind Joshua. Joshua. Look with me at the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. This is Moses speaking to Joshua. Now, if you know the history of Israel, you know Moses has led Israel for 40 years. He's not going to take Israel into the promised land. Joshua is going to do it. So Moses is giving Joshua some last-minute instructions. Listen to what he says here. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, in the presence of all Israel, is he accountable? (laughs) Yeah, all Israel. Be strong and what? Courageous. Courageous. For you must go with this people into the land the Lord swore to their fathers to give them, and you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord gave this command to Joshua, son of Nun. Be strong and courageous, for you will bring the Israelites into the land. I promised them on oath, and I myself will be with you. Wow. Now this is Joshua talking to, I mean, this is Moses talking to Joshua. If you were Joshua, how would you receive that? Okay, Moses, whatever you say, okay, okay. But then God speaks to Joshua. Joshua chapter 1. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. Whoa. What a promise. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. And do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth Meditate on it once a week on Sunday morning. (laughs) As my mother said, if the shoe fits, wear it, right? Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. It's one thing to have Moses assure me. It's a whole other thing to have God speak to me. What's the essence of all that? Be strong and courageous. I believe there's three sources of courage for us as Christians. Three sources of courage. I'm always amused that people say, okay, I'm going to be brave. I'm going to be courageous. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're going to fail. Unless you resort to these three sources of courage in your life. You want to know what they are? The first source of courage for us as Christians is the continuing presence of God. (laughs) 
I will never leave you. I will be with you. God told Joshua. Jesus echoes that at the end of Matthew's gospel when he gives a great commission. And he says what? Matthew 28. I am with you always to the very end of the age. The presence of God. The presence of God is with me. He's not taking a nap. He's not in the bathroom. He's with me. Paul takes it a step further. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 16, he says, Do you, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit, what? Lives in you. He's not just with me. He's in me. He lives in me. And he's not leaving because he has sealed me. He's locked in. He can't get out. I often remind him of that. God, I know you're here. I know you're in me. Help me. (laughs) Help! That's a prayer he always answers. Do you know that? Help! Does he know better than we do? What's the first source of courage for us? The continuing presence of God. The second source of courage is the promise of God. Does God keep his word? Or is he a liar? Does he try to fake us out? He says one thing, does another. No. Again, I call your attention to what he tells Joshua in chapter 1 of that book. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people into inherit the land. I swore to their fathers to give them. I made a promise. I made a promise. And again, Jesus tells us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always to the end of the age. What's the first source of courage for us? The continuing presence of God in our lives. What's the second source of courage for us? The promise of God. And here's the third source of courage. The power of God. The power of God. Again, in Joshua chapter, ver- chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong, courageous, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. With his power. With his power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The continuing presence of God, the promise of God, and the power of God. And based on these resources, these divine resources, God called Joshua to obey him. And he says, this will lead to prosperous, successful ministry and life. Can we claim that? Can that be true for us or just Joshua? Joshua was a special character and so none of this relates to us? What do you think? No. The same is true for us. Everything he said to Joshua is true for us. Look at verse 10 with me of our passage. He says, you are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. What's a father's duty? What's a father's duty? Just to bring the money home? Is that a duty? What's a father's duty? I submit to you a father's duty is to lead by example. Lead by example. If you're a father here this morning, what kind of example are you to your family? What kind of example are you? What are your priorities? As fathers, we need to set an example of virtuous integrity. Virtuous integrity. 
I'm a man of my word. You can trust me. I'm faithful to God's word. I'll lead you in the way you should go. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. He's speaking to fathers. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen and let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. First Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ I became your father through the gospel. Therefore I urge you to what? Imitate me. Chapter 11, verse 1. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. We're to be examples. Not only to one another, but especially to our sons, our daughters. How many young ladies need an example of a godly father? I want to marry someone to like dear old dad. I watched him. He was faithful to mom. He led us. He prayed with us and for us. He was our greatest father. Guys like that, not around very many. Who said amen? So Paul cites his own examples and his conduct as examples to the Thessalonians in holiness, righteousness, blameless. He was exemplary as a spiritual father setting the standard for these Thessalonian believers. Someone has to take the lead. Would you agree? Someone has to be the point of the spirit. Someone has to be out in front. Follow me, he says, as I follow Christ. Fathers. We're to lead by example, but also, not only by example, but also we're to instruct our children. We show concern about their well-being. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Sadly, today, most of the instruction fathers have abdicated and left to the mothers. Mothers, you teach your children. No, that's addressed to fathers. How much more powerful it is when a father sits down with his children and instructs them in the word of God. Teaches them, this is how we go. You've seen it in my life. We're so quick to try to get our kids to Jesus. First thing, Jesus. Tell Jesus you love him. Have Jesus in your heart. And our children dutifully will do that. I'm going, no, 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 no. What should we as parents, and particularly fathers, teach our children first and foremost? We teach them the law. We teach them the law. Why? 
because without the law, they don't know that they are sinners. You teach them the law. You make them aspire to obeying the law. And pretty soon you begin to hear, I can't do this. I can't do this. It's too hard. It's too hard. You know what that is? That's a cue. A cue now, you switch to the gospel. You tell them, Jesus has done it all for you. (sighs) Really? (laughs) Jesus did it for me? Oh, wow. Thank you, Jesus. How many can identify with that sentiment? Yeah. Yeah. Paul describes this fatherly instruction in three verbs, or three, actually they're participles, but they're verbs, verses 11 and 12. Look with me. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory encouraging fathers need to be encouragers it's one thing for moms to encourage but when a dad comes along and encourages his son or daughter makes all the difference the word is in the greek text uh parakaleo from which we get parakletos which describes the holy spirit as one who comes alongside of us to do what to help us Isaiah chapter 41, verse 13. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will what? I'll help you. He comes alongside, takes hold of our hand, and he helps us. What a beautiful picture. This is the father image. It's what fathers do. Secondly, he talks about comforting. Comforting. Sometimes dads don't know how to comfort. They still don't know how to comfort. Is life hard? Full of obstacles? Failures? Our kids blow it? How do you comfort somebody? The picture is one of tender, restorative, compassionate, uplifting needed by a struggling, burdened, heartbroken child. My son taught me how to do this. He would say to me, Dad, I just want you to listen. I want to get to the bottom line. So early on in his life, I took, I took this little strategy, especially as he was going through high school and starting to separate and be his own person and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we, we had an open door policy in our house. There was no, no, nothing behind closed doors. So he'd be working on his computer or doing schoolwork or doing something in his room. I would just go in his room. I'd lay on his bed. Just be quiet. I wanted him to get used to me being in his space. What are you doing in here? I I just want to be with you. I'm not going to bug you. I'm not going to ask you a million questions. Just I want to be. A lot of times I fell asleep on his bed. My strategy was that he would get to a place where he was comfortable with me in this age range now in his space. And it wasn't long before he would turn to me from what he was doing and he'd start opening up and talking. And I'd listen. The very fact that I listened gave him comfort. He could trust me. Fathers. And then the final verb that Paul uses 
In the NIV translation here, it's urging. Urging. Literally, imploring those Thessalonians that any deviation from the way they had been taught would have indeed serious consequences. Don't leave the path. Don't go to the right or to the left. Every so often as Michael was growing up, he'd come to me and he'd say, Dad, I need a discipline. (laughs) He would admit it. Because he felt himself the pressure of going off to the right or to the left. I need a discipline. Does God discipline those he loves? Oh, yes. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12. He says, in your struggle against sin, all of us, right? You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Oh, pastor, I've been really fighting this. Yeah, but you haven't shed blood over it. You just don't hate it enough. And you've forgotten that word of encouragement. (laughs) Notice it's that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loved and he punishes, more literally, chastises everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're illegitimate children, not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his what? Holiness. Holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Have we noticed that? Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Do we need discipline in our life? Yeah, absolutely. We're all prone to wander. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, remember? We all have hearts that are just a little bit still prone to wander. and God brings us back. Again, my son would say, I need to I need a discipline. I'm feeling this, this wandering. We would bring a discipline to bear. And like a father whose goal is the mature wisdom of his children, Paul concludes his exhortation that as their spiritual father, he will, in fact, continue his efforts in their lives so that they would live lives worthy of God. We do this every week. Encourage each other. Live lives worthy of God. Do we not? That's a, that's a familiar theme, a familiar message for all of us, whether it's me or Andrew or Michael or Jared or Nick or anybody who's up here. You've always hear that thread. We urging, urging us all to continue to live lives worthy of God. God who has called us into his kingdom and his glory. I submit to you that should be, and in fact is, incentive to a high quality of life. When you think about what God has called us to, it's just not this everyday life. He's called us to his kingdom and to his what? Glory. God, I want, to, I want to know that glory. I want to experience that glory. And it necessitates me to live the kind of life that evidences that reality. High quality of life. Don't settle for anything less. Don't settle for anything less. Aspire for holiness. Aspire to righteousness. Aspire to these things. For the glory of God. Amen?
Lord, thank you again. We love you today. I thank you for a faithful congregation, Lord, people who love your word, people who love to come and fellowship and just enjoy being together. Lord, we're delighted, delighted to share our lives with each other, delighted to share your gospel. We ask you now as we come to your table, Lord, Holy Spirit, just search our hearts. And if there's any wrong way in us, convict us of that. Lord, that we may confess those things, repent of them, and enjoy your grace and your forgiveness once again. Amen.